So welcome, Kim Fraser. Uh, I'm Sam Punch from Bridge of Mind Sport for All, and we're delighted to be speaking to you today because um, we're here to talk about your book, um, Gaining the Mental Edge at Bridge, which was published uh, a couple of years ago now by Masterpoint Press. And last year you won the um, uh, Book of the Year Award from the International Bridge Press Association. And many of the topics that you cover in your book are of interest to us as researchers for Bridge of Mind Sport for All and for the conference in June. So we're delighted here to talk to you about some of those um, things that you found. And to kick off, I'd just like to start with why did you write the book? Yeah, great. Well, thanks, Sam, for having me. And I'm delighted to be a participant in the con conference. Um, I guess I started to write the book after a chance conversation with the captain of the Australian Open team. And uh, he described a situation where um, he he was focused on a hand that he'd made a mistake on and he couldn't get that hand out of his mind and consequently made a mistake in a following hand. And I said, oh, I think you need um, some sports psychology applications for bridge. And so I started to write a series of articles and then I retired from work and so I, I turned the article, I had time on my hands and I turned the articles into a book. And that was how the book came to be, but it took quite a long time to go from that original conversation to the end product. And how did you hope that the book might be used? Um, yeah, so I like to think of the book as being a mental toolbox of different skills and tactics that players can use or not use, pretty much like they use um, different bridge conventions or choose not to use them. They can choose to use those tactics and tools in the book that will work for them. And the ones that they're already competent at or don't have any issues with, they can just ignore those and, and, and use the ones that will help them be better players. And I know that you're a shooting Commonwealth champion um, and you've won several gold medals. Um, and I'd like to know a bit more about what you see as the similarities between bridge as a mind sport and other physical sports. Yeah, so I think um, it doesn't really matter, I think, whether it's um, a mental game like bridge or a sport. Every, every activity is broken into three levels, uh, physical, mental and technical. And in bridge, just like in sport, you have um, technical aspects, you have mental aspects. And I think you also have physical aspects because the players, a, a bridge tournament can go for quite a long time, many, many days. And the players who are physically um, out of shape will probably find they're tiring more quickly towards the end of the tournament than those that are um, a, a bit more physically uh, adept. So I think in in while in bridge, you probably don't need, need the same level of physical um, capacity as an elite sports person. I think you still need some level and you probably need to focus more on the mental and, and technical side of things. And in your book, you talk quite a bit about uh, focus and concentration. Are these similar or in what ways are they different? Yeah, I think they're quite similar. In fact, um, when we were talking before the interview about the different questions and I thought about this and, and I see concentration as your overall attention span for the duration of an event. Whereas I think focus is where you cause yourself to zero in or, or refocus your attention after you've lost your concentration. So being able to refocus your mind on the task at hand by having some tactics or techniques that you can use to, to bring your attention back after a distraction has occurred is the way I see the difference between the two. But they are very similar. And are they both important or is one more important than the other? Um, I think they're both important. I mean, I think when you think about concentration, at times you need to take a mental break in, in any activity. So in a bridge tournament that, that a round might go for two hours, we one attention span can't maintain be maintained for that two hour period. So you need a way to take a mental break during that two hour period. And then when you want to refocus to get back on track for the next time you need to pay attention, if you like. So, so focusing in and having a keyword or um, a, a technique that will allow you to bring your attention back is, is a really good tactic to employ. And do you see a link between confidence and performance? 
Ah, uh, yes. So I think um, when you when you when you're confident, you believe you can win. And when you lose that confidence, every time something goes wrong, you start to doubt yourself. And so I think confidence is really important for your belief in your ability to win. I think we've seen this in in many sports where uh, players go into a, um, a a final and they're they're in a winning position, but they just don't have that same level of confidence as perhaps the top seed. And so whilst they might be in a position to win, there's always that little bit of nagging doubt in their mind and they and they start to to question their own ability. And, and so consequently, often, the, um, you know, they snatch defeat from the claws of victory, if you like. So I think having confidence in your own ability and believing that you can win are, are both really key elements in success in both both mind sports and physical sports. And is there anything you can do to increase confidence? Uh, well, you can you can do um, mental exercises that that will help you increase your own confidence level. So, and you can play um, little word games with yourself. So, so you can say things like um, an example I use in the book is if you're playing a player that's beaten you in the past, you can say, well, um, this player Fred. beat Fred so therefore I can beat this person too so you can you can give yourself a little um, confidence boost in the arm by 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 some self-talk some positive self-talk as opposed to um, having this this little nagging thought about can I really beat this person and you also mentioned in the book about uh, critical points and mm -hmm. that these critical points can make the difference between winning and losing. Can you say a bit more about what these are and what can be done to turn them into winning rather than losing moment? Yeah, so I think a critical point in a in a match is um, can be where um, let's say you've had a hand and you've made you've made a mistake on that hand, and um, the critical point for me is being able to let that mistake go and say, okay, that's gone. I'm, I'm resetting now. I'm starting from here. And, um, and to not allow that, that mistake to, to occupy your point, occupy your thoughts and to cause you to um, make another mistake or to dwell on that uh, going forward. So you can say things like, well, um, you know, they might have a bad result at the other table or if, if you're playing teams or um, my my bridge partner does this thing where he rips up his scorebook after they've, he's had a bad board and he says, OK, I'm tearing up my scorebook now. I'm starting from zero. So I'm back at zero. We're even, you know, and I'm going to try and win from there. Or you can um, use uh, an example from your past where you came from behind in a match. and You can say, OK, in the past, you know, when this last time I, I kind of moved on and I, and I played really well for the rest of the set and 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 consequently I brought the victory home and so you can use those kind of um, positive thoughts to change that ne that mindset from I've had this bad thing happen to I, I can still win this um, and I think that 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 critical point is th those critical points are where you make that right decision um, at that point in time. These are great tips. Um, what else would you say affects players' ability to perform at their best? Um, well, bridge is a partnership game and um, it's it's surprising to me how often one sees um, partners bickering at the table and um, or a mistake we made and then the partner, instead of just moving on, you know, they, they do things that that make the person feel even worse. And it, there are there are things that you can do to support your partner rather than to make them feel like they've 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 let the side down, if you like. So I think there are there are many many um, tactics that can be employed. And in the book, I try and talk about all these different kinds of things that you can do to help bring success to you as a partnership. Could you give us an example of how that might work in practice? Yeah, so I was playing in a tournament and um, my partner uh, was really tired. She had a very long day, hadn't slept well the night before. And um, she made a couple of mistakes on boards that um, 
that she would normally have not not made. And I could see she was getting a little bit down on herself. So I it was a long match and I said, um, look, um, I, I need to take a break and um, I'm going to go and make myself a tea. Would you like one? So I, I got up and I went and went to the loo and made myself a cup of tea and made her a cup of tea and brought them back. And later she said to me, and then she played quite well for the rest of the round and it sort of gave her a little bit of an energy boost as well. So using a moment where you can see that your partner has is having a, a, a tough time of it, you know, they've lost their, their confidence or they're a bit tired or they've lost their, their, their mojo, if you like, um, you know, and you can do something to kind of boost them along and, and say, it's okay that you made this mistake. You don't make anything about the mistake. You just say, um, look, I, I'm feeling a bit, bit, bit tired of myself. I need a little break. And so you take it on yourself to help protect your partner from themselves, if you like. So, and are there any tools that we haven't covered that you'd like to mention as top tips for players yeah. reading it? Yeah. So, so I suppose one one thing I'd like to say is, um, I wrote the book, and it was designed for players at all levels. So I tried to demystify the whole psychology thing and to, to bring it down to layman's terms, which might horrify the academics amongst us. But at the end of the day, I think a, a book is only as good as the audience that, that re, you know, that can benefit from it. And I tried to make a, a toolbox that players of all levels could get something out of and hopefully improve their game. Because to me, there's nothing more exciting than beating people when they're playing well. Nobody wants to beat up the bunnies in the first round. Everyone wants to, you know, beat other good players when they're playing at the top of their game. And I think that's what gives everyone the most satisfaction. And I felt that if I could um, bring my knowledge from sport into the bridge world and improve the overall um, standard around the world, then that would be a good thing for bridge because when people play well, they enjoy a game more. You know, when they're winning, they enjoy it even more. There's nothing like winning. So that's a really good point that you mentioned there about how academics can dialogue with uh, practitioners in the bridge world. So, I mean, do you have any tips for academics about how to make their work more accessible? Um, well, I, I suppose what I tried to do was to use real world examples. And I think that the academic articles that I've read and I and I had to do some research in in writing some of the stuff in the book. And I found that, you know, if you could find a real world example and use that, it, then, then it cr brings your research more to life. And one of the things that I, I would um, think my book would have benefited from would have been to be able to have had some um, actual um, peer-reviewed research to support the um, the assertions in the book. And in the time frame that I was doing it, it wasn't possible to have that kind of research. But if I ever did another book, that would be certainly something that I would love to include to actually have some examples of players who've used some of the tactics and they've and and, and who can bring real life examples to to illustrate which, you know which which particular things work well and which things, you know, maybe don't work so well. Um, and yeah. I mean, the book was written maybe probably close to two years ago now, or maybe even a bit longer than that, but it's a long, long time in the making, I'm sure. Um, is there anything else that you wish you might have done differently? Um, yeah, uh, not so much. I mean, I think I, I think it had about the it was about the right length and it had about the right level of topics. You know, it, I suppose it could always have used a bit more proofreading, um, and a, and you know maybe a good editor, as uh, one reviewer very kindly said. But um, but on the whole, you know, for a first book, I was I was pretty happy with it, and um, I'm I know that you know. Uh, I've had a lot of unsolicited comments from players who've approached me and said they've really liked the book and they love this chapter or they've used this technique or they've found this thing really helped them. So, and one lady even came up to me and said, I've got this rubber band on my wrist because I talk about having this thought stopping procedure and, you know, when you're negative 
flick this rubber band and stop yourself from thinking negatively. So it, it's really quite fun to have people come up and say, oh, I, I think your book's fabulous and it's really helped me a lot. I think that's the most gratifying thing. And will the elastic band help you stop saying anything negative to your partner when things go wrong? Ah, well, I, I try very hard not to say negative things, but um, sometimes it doesn't always work. Sometimes it's very, very hard to bite your tongue and say, oh, God, you just mangled that hand. <laughs> yes. Save so how do you find it to put into practice the principles that you talk about in your book? Um, I find some of them easier than others. So I'm a very positive person by nature. So I find all the positive stuff really quite easy to put into practice. Um, I find the, the hardest parts for me are um, I'm very critical of myself and consequently I can be quite critical of others. And I find it, it you know, it really, really hard to sort of um, at times just um, bite my tongue and not say anything about, you know, a play that's been made or, you know, why did you why did you bid that or why did you do that, you know, and and uh, and, I, and often it's 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 not intended to be um, um, derogatory. It's more, I, I don't understand why you would do that. Can you tell me why you did that? Because I sort of think they must have had some logical reason. I'm not trying to, you know, be critical of them. I'm more trying to understand, well, why would you, why would you play like that? You know, was there some some something that I didn't understand about why you were doing that in that way? So yeah, it's quite it's quite a challenge. Others don't always perceive it in that way, even no, if it's that's intended right. with that's good right. intentions. Yeah. It's not always yeah. received in the same yeah. vein. Indeed. So, so be a second book? Um, perhaps in maybe in ten years, <laughs> if I still have enough energy to write one. It took quite a long time to write this one. So perhaps. Um I and it's great that you're participating in the BAMSA conference at the end of June. What questions would you like to see discussed there? Yeah, so I think there's uh, two main questions I'd like to see. The first one um, is around bridge being a partnership game. And, um, you know, in the sporting world, sporting people make partnerships with people and they tend to stick with that same partner, whether it's rowing or tennis or diving you know they 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 play their sport with that same person pretty consistently for a four-year period whereas in bridge partners seem to get chopped and changed um all over the place and and i find it really strange because i would have thought that playing in bridge in it being a partnership game it seems to me that it's the one percent of hands that um, make the difference between winning and losing and having that real partnership understanding, which only comes from longevity with the one partner, is would be so critical to success. I don't quite understand why players wouldn't try and build that kind of rapport with their partner over a, such a long period of time rather than playing with, certainly in Australia, they seem to play with this person in this tournament and some other person in the next tournament and it's quite I find it quite strange and the other aspect I suppose I'd like to see discussed is in sport nearly everyone has a coach but in bridge almost nobody has a coach and um, you know what would the role of the coach be in terms of helping people in mind sports to improve yeah well these are great questions so um, we can pick up on these again at the end of June but thanks so much Kim for speaking with us today and we look forward to hearing more um, at the end of June at the conference thanks a lot terrific okay thank you Sam